Um, so welcome. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you know what this is? Uh, movie theater. This is the no. Faraday Lecture Theater. So this oh is where gosh. Michael Faraday is that right? lectured in his Christmas lectures. It's this historic. is where he discovered electricity. It's historic. And made it practical. It's very historic. Fantastic. Well, and, good. And, good. And, and the reason we, we kind of did it here is because of your reputation with invention and association with invent. So very nice. Well, thank you. I'm delighted to be here. So I hear you've been traveling in style in the last 24 hours. <laughs> A nice little photo this morning. You want to stick that up there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, I, it always takes, we always get so caught up in traffic when we land in Luton to come into the city center. And uh, so yesterday we decided that we were going to take the train in the tube. And this, of course, went through HP, like, what is Meg Whitman doing on the tube? <laughs> but I was the happiest woman I ever was yesterday because it was super fast, yeah. super efficient. It was awesome. So. And I, I don't blame you for holding it on so tight to that handbag. <laughs> uh, coming from, there's a, there's a lot of dodgy people in Luton. So, so you, uh, you must be a busy, busy, busy person at the moment. Yeah, so there's a lot going on in our industry. There's a lot going on at HP, a lot going on at Softcat. So, um, you know, it's, but it's great. I came to Europe on... Um, after two days in New York, because we're, as you know, we're separating HP into two companies, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, which is the server storage networking converged infrastructure cloud software part of the business, and then our printing and PC business, which we're calling HP Inc. So we've been doing a little bit of a equity roadshow. Yeah, but it's been, it's been fun, a lot going on. And boy, our industry is changing at lightning speed. I've never seen anything quite like this. You know, the opportunities to, to make your businesses stronger, better, more competitive, with help from Softcat is really remarkable. So it's an exciting time, I That's think, to be in the industry. So and it feels like the economies are coming back, about, right? Yeah, you know, about, yeah. it feels, the UK feels a lot stronger to yes. us. Our business here is growing. I know your business here is growing. I mean, the UK, I sort of, I feel like, you know, you guys have done a really nice job in, in sort of some of the austerity, which was very difficult at the time, but I think it's paying dividends. I mean, you would know better than I, but it, boy, it seems like the economy is picking up. Yeah, and, and HP UK, can you comment on that? We sort of see the worldwide numbers, but we don't really yeah. see the HP UK numbers. So I don't know if you know this, but uh, the UK is the largest business um, that we have outside the United States. So the second largest country in the world for Hewlett Packard is the UK. Which is disproportionate to the economy, so it's yes. outperforming. Yes, so it's outperforming. We have a long, proud history in this country. Um, we have some of our very best people um, in this country. And, um, you know, it's, I think because in some ways there's also a close relationship between the UK and the US that, that uh, the UK probably gets a disproportionate share of, of attention from, from the US. But the business is doing very well, growing market share in servers, storage, networking, growing market shares in PCs and printing. The PC market's in a, you know, sort of another sort of cyclical downturn a little bit right now. But, uh, but the only thing that I can ask my team um, is, you know, are we gaining share? No matter what the market's doing, are yeah. we gaining share? And I think that's the question you have to ask. In your business, yeah. whatever is happening, you know, are you gaining share? Are you doing better than your competitors? And, uh, and we certainly are. So we feel really good about it. It's an exciting, exciting market and a big, important market for us. So Andy's in your good books. I saw him come in. There he is. That's yes. Andy Isherwood, who's the UK MD of uh, HP. So. Yes. I, I have Andy on my bat phone. <laughs> <laughs> So t tell us about the, uh, the separation again. So I think you announced it almost exactly a year ago. Yep. Uh, and tell us why you wanted to do that and what you're hoping to achieve from it and, and how is it going? Yeah. Well, you um, might recall about four years ago, HP announced that possibly under a previous CEO that a p possibly we were going to spin off just the PC business. And that created a lot of anxiety in the marketplace. Um, and so I was brought in as the CEO and the very first decision I had to make was, did we want to spin the PC business or not? And the decision I made four years ago was no, that we had to put a steady hand on the tiller. We needed to reignite the innovation engine at HP. I wanted to make improvements to our balance sheet. I wanted to restore the trust of partners and customers. And so I said, we just can't cope with that right now. And I don't even know if it's the right answer, but we, we just need to stabilize the company. And so we embarked on a five-year turnaround journey that really has had quite remarkable results. I think we've done a remarkable job of um, restoring the, the customers and partners' um, faith in HP. 
Um, we restored our balance sheet. We went from $12 billion of debt on the operating company to $3.8 billion of net cash on the operating company in just four years. We reignited the innovation engine, uh, and whether that is our thin and light PCs, our managed print service offering that we often do with partners, um, to ink in the office, to the next generation of server, the Gen 9 server, all flash storage array, uh, to our wireless networking capability. We have ignited this engine. And so what I said to the board last summer is I said, how do we continue this turnaround? And the thing that had changed most for me was the speed of the markets, which I mentioned earlier. I've been in business 35 years. I've never seen anything like this. I call it the new style of business. And it is the new style of business that's powered by IT. Almost every business is going to end up being an IT business for competitive purposes. You know, can you respond to your customers faster? Can you write applications faster? Can you have a lower cost of running your infrastructure so you can invest in things that will grow your business, IT or otherwise? So we decided that it made sense to, to separate the company for focus, for being more nimble, for shaping our industry. And um, in classic business definition, I think these businesses are, are in many ways quite different businesses with different customers, different uh, cost structure. And, and uh, so we decided that they would be better and more nimble apart. And so we announced a year ago, as you said, um, to separate the companies. And um, I think it's exactly the right thing. And we will maintain some of the benefits, most of the benefits, I think, of working together. You probably know that together, our PC and our um, server business, we are 60, well, more than that. We are actually, I won't say, we are Intel's largest customer and a big chunk of Intel's profit. And so we don't want to lose that leverage in the marketplace. The same is true for many other components. So we have a supply chain agreement between the two companies. And then we want to make sure that um, as we work with you, you know, we're not more complicated to work with because we have separated that we're faster, more nimbler, and you get more of what yeah. you need from and, us. And we're not seeing any more complexity at the moment. Yeah. So. so you're only a month away from it now. Are you yes. nervous? No. Confident? We're super calm. I mean, we, uh, we had to separate. This was a big undertaking. And as IT professionals, you can imagine that the IT separation was the most complicated part of this. You know, 750 systems, 3,500 applications, 50,000 new servers. And um, we accomplished this in really nine months. August 1st, we, we started operating as two separate companies. Um, so separate supply chain, separate financials, invoicing, everything is separate now. And uh, we had to work with 3,500 partners to make sure that you were ready to handle us. Yeah. And um, by the way, you guys were great. Thank you yeah. for no, everything it, you did. You were easy. fantastic. You made it very easy. So, um, so we're done. I mean, we are literally, we are separated. Um, we um, have raised the, you know, we've had to migrate, as I said, some debt from Inc. to um, Enterprise. That is completely We finished that offering yesterday in a pretty choppy market, by the way. But, you know, the reputation of Hewlett Packard, um, I think, carried the day. And uh, then on November 2nd, we start trading as two separate companies. Hewlett Packard Enterprise under the stick ticker symbol HPE and HP Inc. will retain the ticker symbol HPQ. So onward and upward, every single person at HP is rostered to one of the two companies. Everyone knows what they're doing. Everyone understands the strategy of the two companies. And frankly, this separation allowed us to look at some business processes, the way we did things that allowed us to say, you know what, there's an opportunity to be even more efficient, even more partner friendly, even uh, you know, better innovators. So it was a pretty good process for yeah, us. No, don't worry, well. And culturally, do you think the two organizations will be quite different going forward or similar styles, similar flavor? Do you think they'll change from where they are today? Yeah. So I think you know, over time, I suspect there will be some changes. But the core DNA of Hewlett Packard will carry on to these two companies. I mean, the, the founding principles of one of the great, iconic global companies will continue. And at our core, we are innovators. You know, when I came to HP, I learned a long time ago that founder DNA is really powerful. For those of you who are founders of your own companies, founder DNA is very powerful. And even after 75 years, a number of acquisitions, when I came to HP, that founder DNA just shined through. And effectively, it's we're innovators at heart, and we're all about our partners and customers. We will do anything 
for partners and customers. And um, we just, that's the DNA of the company. So when I came to HP, we just doubled down on those elements of the culture. And um, you could see it when we ask HP to do something that is consistent with historic DNA, it works really well. When we ask the organization to do something that's not, yeah. you know, in the, in the muscle memory, yeah. it's much more difficult. Yeah. So I, I know that those two elements will be an important part of the go forward culture and be quick and fast. I think speed is incredibly important in the world in which we live. And you know the disruptive nature of what can happen in an industry. My favorite example, which you all know well, is Uber. Uber's been around only for seven years. And I'll give you a, an example out of San Francisco. So the taxi industry in San Francisco had seven years to react to Uber, and they didn't. And I happen to know the head of the taxi association about three years ago, ago, he called his CIO, his head of technology, and he said, we know we gotta react to Uber. We gotta write a mobile app. We gotta kind of copy them because we're gonna lose share. And the CIO said, I hate to tell you, we are still on CB radios. And so they almost couldn't react. So the case in point is you've gotta have a technology infrastructure um, and someone who can help you use technology to your competitive advantage or you may well be disrupted. So the report just came out last week. The taxi industry in the last two years in San Francisco is down 67%. Wow. I mean, that is a business that has changed overnight because of the use of technology and the incumbent couldn't react. Yeah. And I think that's something we all have to be thoughtful, whether it's Softcat or HP or all of you, you know, is your business ready from an IT perspective to handle the idea economy, the newest idea, a threat, or capitalize on an opportunity that you see to grow your business. And my view is IT and business strategy are now interlinked, yes. right? It's the same. It used yeah. to be you could have a business strategy, you could have an IT strategy. I think it's interlinked. And in the US, what kind of role is the government playing in that? So yeah, we've got lots of Uber situations going on in, in France yes. and, and, and the UK. There's yeah. new legislation going to stop them booking a cab within five minutes, et cetera. Does the U.S. tend to get involved in that or just let them do it? Um, the U.S. government does not tend to get as involved um, as perhaps in Europe, but the incumbents get very involved. And um, I know this from my eBay days. Remember what we did at eBay is we created an entirely new marketplace. There was no land-based analog for what eBay did. And um, the incumbents ran, not walked, to the government to try to get them to stop eBay. So at eBay, for example, we were the largest, and probably still are, the largest used car dealer in the United States. Um, and of course, in the United States, the car dealers have territories that you're not too allowed to encroach upon. And so they tried to stop us through legislation, but they were unsuccessful. Um, but what happens whenever you're creating something entirely new, people try to stop you because yeah. the incumbents are deeply threatened by the next thing. So Uber's going to have to work through, I know there was a strike yet last night in London against yeah. Uber. There was a, they stopped all of Paris. This is the normal thing. I mean, my view is technology marches on. Yeah. And if it's good for customers and more convenient and more cost effective, it's really hard to stop. Maybe in places like Russia or China, it's a little easier to stop, but, yeah. <laughs> but not here. So you're going to be involved in both companies moving forward. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about how your role will differ between the two organizations and just give us the kind of key strategies for both organizations and your expectations of those two companies moving forward? Sure. So I will be the president and chief executive officer of Hewlett Packard Enterprise. That's, a, again, as I said, our server storage networking converged infrastructure software business. I will also be chairman of HP Inc., Dion Weisler, who many of you may have met, Martin knows him well, will be the CEO, President and CEO of HP Inc. So why did we set it up this way? Really for management continuity and strategic continuity, because part of what ailed HP four years ago was too many CEOs in too short a period of time. I was the third CEO in as many years. So we wanted continuity. And, um, and so we decided that this was the best way to do it. And we also, HP Inc. and Hewlett Packard Enterprise, we need to be each other's best partners. I like to say that we were born in a one-car garage and we're moving to a two-car garage. And so we're still in the same garage. A lot of mechanics are gonna work on the same cars, 
but that, that leadership continuity to make sure that we get these two companies off on a good foot with the right cultural aspects was important to us. So um, I think the good news for Dion is that I know exactly what a chairman is supposed to do. <laughs> and the chairman's supposed to set the tenor and tone of the board, make sure the board is helpful to um, the CEO and um, looks out for the shareholders and, and appropriate governance. But the role of the chairman is not to run the company. And I don't know if you, many of you have ever had chairmen who actually try to run the company. It's really inconvenient. Yeah. And uh, so I am not confused about my, what my role is there. Yeah, and I've I, had a I, bit of that. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to Dion the other day, I said, you are the luckiest CEO alive because I know exactly what my role is. Anyway, and we get, we get along very well and it's going to be very productive. Um, and then obviously my role on Hewlett Packard Enterprise is to, is to continue to run that part of the business. Um, strategically, um, are on HP Inc., the strategy there is to continue to be the leading personal systems and uh, printing uh, supplier in the world with an incredible network of, of partners uh, across the globe. And we've, you could have see how we have reignited um, the innovation engine around devices, around printing. And the good news about that focus company is they will be able to focus on printing, yeah. which is a fantastic business. They'll be able to focus on the device business. And then they've got a couple of very interesting um, out-of-the-box innovations. Um, I think many of you might be familiar with Sprout, our, Im our immersive computing opportunity. This is state-of-the-art. This is the ability to take an object, scan it into 2D, manipulate it, change the shape, change the color, and then print it out on a 3D printer. So it is from analog to digital to analog. And we sell Sprout now through, really I think through most countries in the world and, and uh, off of our website. And the amazing thing is how often Sprout is bundled with a consumer 3D printer. So this is expanding now to commercial um, applications in the fall, later this fall and next year. And we think it's a, it's a whole breakthrough category. There is no land-based analog. And then the other exciting thing, um, which I think all of you should keep an, an eye on, is 3D printing. Now, 3D printing is at the earliest stages of the growth of a brand new industry. And I don't know, how many of you have watched something print in 3D? So about maybe 20, 40, 30, 40 percent. So the killer about this is how long it takes. Just to print an object like this in 3D would take about five hours. If you've got something bigger, it can take eight or nine or 10 hours. And the quality is uneven. And you can't print in color. And we have a new technology called multi-jet fusion that actually is 10 times faster, much higher quality. And we're the only 3D printing technology that can print in color. So I think this is going to be a really growth area for us. And you should keep an eye on this, because we want to go to market through um, print service providers. Um, you know, I'm not sure how many printers we're going to sell into um, a company, but we, but we will, you know, a company may call, if one of you wanted to be a print service provider, would call you and say, I need to print X, Y, and Z, and then you do it for them and deliver. And I think this has the chance to fundamentally change manufacturing, to change prototyping, and um, it's early days, but I would keep an eye on it because I think this is one of those 10 years from now we'll look back and say, yeah. gee, it turned into a $50 billion industry. Who knew? And do you think it could be a, a volume play? Would I want to add it in five years' time? I think it could be a volume play. I don't know that we will focus. When you're starting a new business, focus, focus, focus. Um, and while I think the 3D printing consumer market is interesting, I think the commercial market is a lot more interesting in terms of the impact and the price points and the profit margins. Okay. So, and then Hewlett Packard Enterprise, very simply stated, our strategy is to um, provide solutions for the new style of IT. And what I mean by that, as we discussed, is it's really a new style of business that is powered by IT. And we're really focused on four transformation areas, what I gather you talked a bit about this morning. Yep. And uh, you know, every customer, every organization has to take their legacy IT infrastructure and say, how do I get to a place that allows me to be lower cost and quicker in terms of uh, whether it's provisioning of servers or application development? And so this transformation to a hybrid infrastructure, I think, is just perfect for the market. 
And you know, that all starts with applications. You know, what applications do you want to have in your data center? What might you want to have in a private cloud or a public cloud or a virtual private cloud? And how do you make that decision? And then who can help you do that transformation? And you need a partner to do that transformation. You certainly do. <laughs> <laughs> and what partner would that be? Softcard. <laughs> so anyway, um, so that's first. The second is security. And whether you are running a small business, a medium-sized business, or a big business, this is a sea change in the landscape, I think, over the last four or five years. Security's always been an issue. But back in the day at eBay, I was just worried about a teenager in you know, Red Deer, Montana, hacking into my system for fame and fortune. This is now organized crime <coughs> and nation states. And they're after your customers' names. They're after their billing information. They're after their credit card information. And, uh, and then on a nation state basis, they're actually trying to shut down governments and big businesses like ours. And um, what we've seen, we um, run security for about 250 big customers around the world. We have 12 security operations centers. And what we have seen is a dramatic escalation in what we call the attack vectors in the last six to seven months. So you do a startup business, you kind of grow revenues, grow revenues, and then the revenues hit the knee of the curve if you're doing well. The attack vectors have hit the knee of the curve. And it is, frankly, Russia, China, and Iran. And then, you know, at the sort of medium to small businesses, it is actually we're seeing, you know, pockets of truly what I would call organized crime. So how you secure your digital assets um, is, I think, something that all of you have to be really thoughtful about. And um, you know, have you got your app secured? Have you got your data center secured? Um, have you got your network secured? And the new applications that you are writing, maybe mobile first, maybe cloud first, are they going through the same level of rigorous testing that you put your legacy apps through? And we just pulled down about 10,000 apps off the biggest app store um, in the United States. And 97% of them had a security hole. Now you might say, well, why is that? It's because in our industry, we got really good at testing legacy applications, yeah. very robust tools. We were pretty good at this. The mobile app testing industry is nascent. Yeah. And so you should really think about if you're writing cloud native or mobile apps, make sure you've tested those applications. And um, you probably need a partner to do that. <laughs> and we're really good at security. <laughs> <laughs> And, and security <laughs> seems to be a big play for you going forward. Yeah. And, and so uh, Sue Barsay, I mean, you used to look after the, the yeah, channel she's, worldwide. She's moving into security. You can always CNN tell when, an, when something is important to a company about who they put in charge. Yeah. And uh, we took one of our most talented executives, Sue Barsamian, who ran the channel worldwide. And as you know, the channel is so important to us. Um, and we asked her to run our security business. So we're pretty excited about that. And then we've got our other two transformation areas. We could come back to those. But they are um, empower a data-driven enterprise. And how do you enable workforce productivity when you've got folks all over the place, mobile, on multi-OS, multi-form factor? You know, how, do you, how do you manage a, a productive workforce? So we could talk about those two if you want to go there. Should we uh, see if there's any questions from the audience so far? So, so far, I've really talked about separation. So anything about the separation areas or the different strategies before we move on to a bit more technology. But if it's, yeah, go ahead. Uh, hi, Meg. My name's Wade Junk. I come from a company called Tent Forty. Um, not that I want to try and realign your views, but I've got a suggestion. Yes. I don't think Uber should be your favourite. I think Skype should be your favourite because you are, in actual fact, a big part of the Skype story. I was. Uh, and I know a bit about Skype. 21 presentations before they got an initial investor in Van Grove. Uh, eBay bought it for 2.6 billion in September 2005. Sold later for 8 billion to Microsoft. Uh, I probably, like a lot of people in the audience, use Skype to talk and see family yep. and friends. But I think I should say, I was lucky, you might have an opinion about this, I was lucky to spend a, a long night in a bar with a guy called Michael Jackson, <laughs> who is not Michael Jackson you think of, he's actually a Brit who was a chief executive of Skype for a long time. Yeah. So I'm interested to hear about the story of Skype yeah. at Eva. So exactly the same story. I just happened to use Uber because it's so current. So Skype disrupted the telecommunications business, right? I mean, if you think about what's going on in telcos right now, they are under tremendous disruptive pressure. Because not only do they have the Skypes of the world, they got all these over-the-top services like Snapchat, you name it, that are using the pipes that the telcos have built, and they're not getting any money for it. And it's totally disrupting how people are communicating. But what we saw on Skype, and the reason that we um, acquired it at eBay, was a very disruptive technology um, that was built on 
today, as you know, in telephone, you, I, you know, one, one, I call you, right? There's just a one way. What they built was a network of people's computers that was actually the intersection of how these phone, these web, these, um, you know, uh, VoIP calls were actually made. Voice over the internet protocols were made. And effectively, it was free to call. So you could talk to your daughter in, you know, on a mission in Zimbabwe for, you know, for free every night if you wanted to. And uh, now in college, I was just with a couple of college kids, they said they leave Skype on all the time in their dorm room, you know, to talk to their friends. And when their friend comes back from whatever they're doing, and they just roll in and they, they talk like they're there. I mean, it's just amazing. And they're in different parts of the world. So I just think it was a remarkably disruptive technology that changed everything. And exactly like Uber, you should have seen the incumbents scream about Skype. Um, and, you know, but now Skype's a part of our daily life and, you know, now deeply embedded, obviously, into Microsoft Link. So I just think, you know, it's a really, it's a great example of, of what happens, you know, all over the world now in terms of the ability to time to value. How do you take an idea and get it deployed in your organization super fast? You know, that's the name of the game now. How do you take ideas that are disruptive, that can grow your business and reduce the time to value? And so one, one thing Michael said, uh, one of his big achievements was to convince the authorities to regulate Skype as a, as a software. Yes. Company. If you look at like Uber, Airbnb, yeah. they are really disruptive and changing the world. They are. They are. And this is what I call the idea economy. And it, remember when I said I think things are speeding up, this sort of new style of business powered by IT, these are perfect examples, right? And if you look at history, I mean, you wonder, so, you know, Companies used to have sort of 30 to 60 year runs, and then they were often disrupted. Then it's sort of 20 to 15 year runs. I mean, I wonder whether the, the, the life cycle of companies and how fast you have to change, it seems to me, is, is accelerating dramatically. And the bigger you get, the harder it is to do. So. Any other questions so far? There's one right there. Gentleman here. So, uh, Martin, I'll ask Sam a question, and then he uh, got that off the hook because you guys walked in just as he was answering. So, let me ask, make this one. Uh, artificial intelligence, what role does HP see themselves having in AI in the yeah. future? So we have really three waves of innovation at HP. We have the you know one to two year out innovation. So in other words, our Gen 9 server, we're already working on Gen 10 and Gen 11. That's what I would call evolutionary innovation that we have gotten much better at and we're all over it. What's the next version of 3PAR all flash storage array? Um, then there is midterm um, uh, innovation, things that are going to maybe come onto the market three to five years. And then there's long-term innovation. And, and I want you to know that we are really now investing in all three waves of innovation. And I would say that artificial intelligence is in the midterm. You know, it's, uh, there's some things we can do with it right now, but we're trying to figure out how we utilize artificial intelligence in um, you know, our, our, how, how the machines talk back to a central service agent. Um, you know, how actually we can know what's wrong with our server or our storage or networking before it actually shows up with a problem. So these are the kinds of things we're doing. We're very interested in artificial intelligence. Um, we don't have a separate business unit focused on artificial intelligence. It lives in HP Labs right now. But I think there's some very interesting applications to, um, to what we are doing as a company. The other thing that is very interesting is everyone talks about IoT, Internet of Things. The reality for us, and I think ultimately um, for the industry here is, as, and I was, just yesterday I was in a self-driving car in Germany. And, um, you know, the, the amount of data that is being ingested by this self-driving car, they've got cameras in the front and cameras in the back, and they're basically ingesting huge amounts of data that have to be computed pervasively in real time almost instantly because the car has to make a decision. Do I accelerate? Do I not accelerate? Do I take a turn? How do I swerve around a vehicle in front of me? And so they're, they're getting there. It's not perfect by any means. They're pretty good at self-driving on the highway because there's not as much data to ingest. The minute you get into the city, it's a problem because they can't actually tell the difference between an immovable object and a moving object, which is a problem. <laughs> <laughs> However, when you open up the back of the car, it's a mini data center, 
right? It's server, it's huge amount of storage, and it's real-time processing. And this is where our Moonshot server technology is perfect because you can't have something that pulls a lot of power and it has to be little. And so what I think is going to happen on Internet of Things is compute is going to move to the edge. As opposed to being a centralized data center, it's going to be in the thing. It's going to be in the car. It's going to be in the aircraft engine. It's going to be in the healthcare um, doctor's office. It's going to be in the patient's bed. It's going to be in the monitoring equipment. And so the notion of making very small, very um, efficient um, compute systems that can go in the edge is a really important part of our long-term. And part of AI is that it can be, if we had, can embed AI into the edge, then it's small, then the thing can be smaller. So that's where we're headed here. It's sort of exciting new times. I have to say, um, you know, the self-driving car thing, I think, is sort of like 3D printing. It has the opportunity to change. It wasn't a VW, change. was it? No, it was not. No. <laughs> okay. have, you, have you ever had to deal with a crisis on that kind of scale as a VW thing in your career? What's the worst crisis like that? Yeah, that huge not on the problem. scale of VW. I have to say this is, um, you know, as a CEO, this is one of the more um, really severe mm. crises, I think, that, that yeah. you could face. And, um, you know, time will tell whether Wintercorn knew about it or who knew about what. I will say, and, and you guys, some of you run quite big companies as then they get bigger. It is the scary thing about running these very large companies. When I came to HP, we had $110 billion of revenue, over 300,000 employees working in 170 countries, working through about 150,000 uh, partners. And you worry, because you're like, hmm, what do you suppose the marketing manager in Spain yeah. is doing? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and... Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a little frightening, right? And, and so the only thing that, that I know how to do is you've got to set a culture for your company. That I, and I have said to HP from the beginning, and I set this culture at eBay, I do not want to be in the gray. There is black and there is white, and I only want to be in the white. And um, the challenge in a global company is ethics is quite different by culture. Um, you know, quite similar, I think, between the UK and the US. You go to Korea, there's actually quite a different mindset about what is okay. And so what I try to tell people is, if your mother or your father or your wife or your sister or someone you deeply love is watching the decision you make, how would they feel about it? And then the second acid test is, if this showed up on the front page of the FT, what would you think about that? And often that is the best way to communicate values and culture as opposed to have a 900 page document of you can do this, you can do that, you can do this, you can do that. And then in a big company, you've got to have a very robust reporting um, opportunity for what we call um, you know, business conduct violations. Because often you find out about this because someone watched someone do something yeah. and then chose to report it. And so you've got to make it easy and safe and you've got to set a tone that you want to know about these things. So I think it's a tough situation at Volkswagen. So do you think the CEO was right to resign even if he knew nothing about it? Do you have yes. to take responsibility? I think you do. And I think it, it was um, unquestionably the board had to do it. Yeah. You know, whether he resigned or was asked to resign, I'm not quite sure. But when there is something as serious as this, from a public relations perspective, you have to, you have to hold someone accountable and you have to do it fast. Because the longer you wait, the worse this gets. So I don't know whether um, Wintercorn resigned or didn't, but it was the right thing for the company because it's the only way now they're going to be able to move on. And uh, I think it's very tough. Um, it's a very, very tough situation. And um, I feel badly for Volkswagen. You know, I think it's a, I, I love their cars. I, you know, I've, I've long admired that company. And it was probably, I mean, who knows, maybe, you know, a small number of rogue actors. Yeah. Yeah, but we'll see. Yeah. So tough, tough, tough. So moving back to uh, innovation, you mentioned innovation yep. a lot. We talked about this as the home of invention. How can you compete in innovation with all these crazy startups that are yeah. fantastic workplaces for young people with crazy brains where you've got to have a slightly different culture to that? You've got yeah. to be slightly, I guess you've got to be slightly more risk adverse. So how do you compete with that in the future? Or do, you, do you outsource more of it to those kind of organizations, or do you do it in-house? Yeah. So a couple of things. One is we have to have our own fantastic innovation engine, and we have to attract young people, um, experienced people, 
who can do incredible things in innovation. And here's my philosophy about this, is that there are a very small number of people who can do truly disruptive innovation. There's lots of people who can do evolutionary innovation, but that disruptive innovation, you have to find those people in your organization. You have to reward them. You have to create an environment that allows them to thrive. And, um, and that doesn't mean letting them do whatever they want. It means giving them a playground of what you, you know, how they can be most productive. And so we, are, we have and are reigniting the innovation engine at HP. And I'll give you a perfect example in servers. We do servers better than anyone else in the world. We have more years of experience, incredible people. And we just turned that server organization loose. And we said, you know, what is the, going to be the operating system, if you will, that's going to link the hardware? What's the bare metal linkage going to be? And we invented a system software product called OneView. Fantastic. Couldn't be any better. And then we were saying, OK, so now how do we, how do we actually build on that? So there's a lot we can do ourselves. But any company will not invent everything by itself. And we live in the heart of, it's a renaissance that's going on in Silicon Valley today. I've never seen anything like it. So one of the things that we're doing now is we've launched a program that we call Pathfinder. And our objective is to find those new next generation companies that are built for the enterprise, not consumer innovation, but enterprise innovation, and then weave them into, as appropriate, those four solution areas. And this is a big change for HP, because in the old days, we said we couldn't really sell or support something that we did not own. Take security. There is a new security company being founded in Silicon Valley every single week. What, we couldn't buy them all if we wanted to. And yet, Sue Barsamian has got to figure out a, serv a security offering that is best of breed for SoftCat and for all of you. So we are going to now make investments in some of these smaller companies, utilize our go-to-market strengths so we bring to you the best of breed of security products. Yep. And what we need to do together is say, it's enterprise ready, we can support it, we know it can scale, so that your customers don't have to figure out, okay, I've got 17 point security products here, like, what do I think about those? And yeah. how do I incorporate them into a solution? Yeah. So we are gonna, we are increasingly, we'll do our own innovation, but also make investments and bring them into part of the solution areas for these, these four big things that we think most of you need. And, uh, and, and so it's a kind of a new day. And, and if we can become known, which we're all, it happens really fast in Silicon Valley, as the curator of great solutions for customers, I will tell you, we got a line at our door right now of small startups who want to utilize HP and, their, and our ability to partner with people like SoftCat to go to market. So we think this is very powerful. And we can't do everything. And, you know, for those of you who, I think most of you are probably running your own businesses here, focus, focus, focus. I mean, when you are a technologist, the great thing about technology companies is they usually, they never met a science experiment they did not like. And that is true at HP. We are, you know, we are science experiments. And we have to focus that to develop real products, but we can, um, you know, we can actually help focus these smaller companies um, in a way that will be, I think, very helpful to you, to helpful to SoftCat, and helpful to us. So that's our, that's our innovation strategy, do a lot of it ourselves, but partner when we need to. And you said for the, the security environment to be uh, enterprise ready through those products. Yeah. And just don't forget the whole SMB community. Yes, you know, yes, um, yes. When I say enterprise, I actually mean SMB. Yeah. And I, I, I was wondering whether I should change my words on that. Because when I say, I use enterprise versus consumer. And enterprise, I mean small to medium-sized to large companies. But you're right. I probably ought to use a slightly you, different HP word. HP have got some fantastic security offerings. And we sell, yeah. we sell a lot of them today. Yeah. But they're mainly the high-ticket, high-priced, mm, okay. big, so good big point. company. OK, good point. And we need to get them OK, it's a good point. So what's the, from a technology standpoint, what do you think the biggest opportunity is? What are you excited about? What's the one thing? You mentioned 3D print. What's yeah. the, which is yeah. going to be a big market, but probably not as big as some of the more traditional things that you're already in. What's the one area that you're really uh, excited about today? Well, let me tell you what I'm excited about, like what is here and now and present in front of us that I think can make a big difference to customers. Um, Aruba. Um, Aruba, so all of your employees are probably mobile. You know, when they come into the office, they want a wireless um, LAN. And Aruba is effectively the best product for wireless campus branch environments 
um, that is super secure. I mean, Dom Orr, who's the head of Aruba, said to me the other day, we're actually a security company disguised <laughs> as a wireless yeah. LAN company. And, uh, and I think with 802.11ac, there's going to be a lot of changes here, and I think it's a big opportunity. And work play, the workforce loves it. Yeah. I mean, loves it. It's wicked fast anywhere on campus, on branch. I think it's a big opportunity. Um, and the, the customer satisfaction and the cost reduction benefits that you get, I think, are, are huge. Um, I am excited about, actually, how to marry applications to different work to yeah. different infrastructure. Yeah. You know, when I started in this business, you had to figure out how to make your application comport to the infrastructure. We spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to make the eBay application run on whatever hardware was available. Today, you actually can get a hardware stack that is really custom to the applications that you're running. And so it makes um, whatever you're running very resilient, um, fast, and, and uh, super safe. So that's a big change. Um, if I think of what the next generation of um, things that we can do is, how do you continue to utilize the data center assets in a more effective way? Yeah. I mean, first it was, you've just had a bunch of server storage and networks sitting in your data center. Then most people virtualized, which improved the return on investment in your data center. Now, with cloud, you can utilize those assets even better. And I think the next step beyond that is what we're calling composable infrastructure. How does your management plane know what infrastructure you have and how do they compose the right level of servers, networking, and storage for the app at a certain particular point in time? So again, it's how do you make it more efficient, how do you make it more cost effective, and how do you utilize the assets that you have in a more efficient way? Tell them everybody why they should go to Discover. So, um, Discover is our big customer Sam's event. Sam's already, already plugged it once, but we're going to plug and, it once. Uh, and uh, you should come and, uh, and see what HP has to offer that you can access through SoftCat. And, um, you know, it's a fantastic event. Bring your IT teams, your leadership teams, and it's just it's exciting, and they will see the possibilities. They'll be able to see how other companies like yours have done things, what's possible, and um, it's right here in London. And um, I think it's completely worth a day of your time to come down if you're not from London and spend the day. I promise you it will be worth it. And what we should do, you know, you know when you show up, it's like you know, buy one, get one free. Yeah. There's like an offer. We will do something very special at London Discover for SoftCat customers. Fantastic. Thank you. So whether that is a cocktail hour or a special tour of yeah. the floor, um, you and I should work Thank together you. about what we want to do there. Um, you know, there would be something I think that we could do that would make it super special for your customers. Thank you. Andy is sitting there going, yes. great, Meg. <laughs> great. That's really great. And uh, what would that be exactly? <laughs> I don't know. We'll figure it out. <laughs> So Aruba's working out well for you, you pleased with it? Aruba's Was that, working out very well. Would you say well. that's the best acquisition in your time? So as I look back on, in my time, yes, but I've only really done one yeah. big one, and that was Aruba. I mean, yeah. Voltage is off to a great start. Um, you know, we uh, have bought a number of small technology eucalyptus. companies. Eucalyptus. We're happy with Eucalyptus. Um, but if you look about over the last decade of acquisitions for Hewlett Packard, the best acquisitions really have been, I think, 3Com, which you know, is now HP Networking, 3PAR, and Aruba. And what do they have in common? They are complementary technologies that are modern technologies that have the wind at their back and can utilize HP's distribution system yeah. and the capabilities of our partners. So as we think about acquisitions going forward, we want to make sure that we're, we're, we're finding complementary products that are valuable to all of you, that are going to make a difference in your capabilities in IT, that will make you money, and um, then we can distribute through our excellent um, value-added reseller network. So those are, and by the way, they don't come along no. every moment, right? Yeah. So you have to be disciplined. The other thing on these kinds of um, acquisitions is you're not paying enormous multiples of revenue or enormous PE multiples, which is hard for us to do. Yes. You know, it's very difficult for yeah. us to buy a company with a 90 times PE. And your appetite, does it feel heightened at the moment for acquisitions or same as ever? You know, I would say probably, I think we're now better positioned. With separated companies, we have much on the Hewlett Packard Enterprise, a very clear criteria for what would make sense for us to acquire. And by the way, so does HP Inc. And when we were together, gosh, there were, the list was too long. And so now we've got quite a focused um, 
uh, list of things that we would be interested in. And then we have now have the balance sheet um, at Hewlett Packard Enterprise that will allow us to do that. So remember what we run is a financing company as well as an operating company. And the net debt on the operating company will be, um, actually the net cash on the operating company will be $5.5 .5 billion of net cash on the operating company. So we've got quite a bit of cash to actually go do things that are of interest to us. And then the operating company obviously has more, I mean the financing company has more debt on it, but it should because it's secured by $12 billion of uh, high quality assets in the field. So on a completely different subject clearly, what do you think of EMC? <laughs> wow. <laughs> so um, I would say that, listen, I think EMC is a, you know, I, long, very successful company in our industry. I know a lot of folks there. I think they've you know, got a, a good leadership team. I will say that I think they may be on the wrong side of history in storage. That when I see the traction that we're getting with 3PAR, which is a modern architecture, high tier, mid tier, low tier, one architecture, lower cost of total ownership, the work we did with 3PAR all flash storage array, I mean, we are just doing so much better than nimble and pure, and the market acceptance of the 3PAR all flash storage array is better than EMC. Yep. So they've got the same challenge that the big IT companies have. They've got to reignite their innovation engine. They've got to get to the new style of IT. And, and not in a um, arrogant way at all, we have made a lot of progress in the last four years because we started earlier. What is coming up to, on companies is there is a big change in the marketplace, and they've got to get after it. We started four years ago not because we were geniuses, because we had to. You know, the business challenges were so big that we had to get on this faster. And now I think we've got a two-year lead time on networking. I think we've got a two-year lead on software-defined networking. I think we've got a couple-year lead on storage. And we've always had a lead in servers, and it's extending. And a lead now in, in some ways around converged infrastructure and hyper-converged. So, I think, listen, you never discount um, people who've been in the market a long time, um, but, but we just happen to have, I think, um, through a lot of sweat, blood, and tears, we happen to have an incredible storage product that uh, is really well adopted yeah. by the market. So any questions from the audience on technology and where HP are going with their, their technology or potential acquisitions or anything like that? <laughs> 20 odd years ago, Fair point. Casio calculator had a little yeah. Yeah. screen on it and it charged itself. Technology's gone and you're talking about Wi Fi, etc., but it's only as good as long as I can surf it and keep my mobile device active. Yeah. Are we progressing that any further? So there's a lot of work being done on this in the industry, particularly in the consumer space. You know, how do you keep these devices charged longer? You know, Charging devices that um, I'm sure you've seen them that you can put next to your bed at night. You don't have to plug them in. You just lie your smartphone down or you lie your computer down. Dion and, and the printing and personal systems business is doing a lot of work on battery life. And um, you know how do, we, how do we keep these devices charged? On the enterprise side, we're doing a lot of work around energy efficiency. If you think about the data centers that need to be built over the next three or four years, it is millions and millions and millions and millions of servers. If you laid them end to end, it would be the length of Manhattan. And there are parts of the world where we do business where there is no more energy on the grid. We work in, in places where literally there's no more energy. And so how do we continue to pioneer around low energy um, consumption compute? And we talked about Moonshot. Um, also HP Apollo, which is our new line of water-cooled servers. So what cools servers? It's air blowing through the servers, and that air takes energy to pump through the servers. If you can water cool them, what happens is the water is heated up by the server, and when the water exits the server, it's hot and can be used to generate energy. So it's a whole new paradigm of energy and space efficiency. And my view is one of the responsibilities we have as a leading manufacturer on the enterprise side is less space, more energy efficiency. Um, which is sort of the corollary of, of battery life in the consumer side of things. So we're deeply focused on this. There's a lot of things going on there that we think are pretty interesting. And this HP Apollo service, that's our high performance compute line. It has had really great acceptance across the board. And I think it's because you get fantastic compute plus you get energy efficiency. So great question, thank you. 
Any other questions on technology? Okay, so before we move on, um, got to ask you, and uh, we plug Discover. So, what do you think of SoftCat? <laughs> <laughs> There's a camera just there. <laughs> <laughs> So I think you and I met each other, what, almost three and a half, yeah, four years yeah, ago. You were, right. When I first came to London yep. on my very first trip, you and I met. And that's because you're one of our most important partners in the world, not just in the UK. And you had um, some suggestions for me, as I recall, <laughs> in the nicest possible British manner. Yes. <laughs> the Americans just yell at me. <laughs> um, and, uh, but what I loved about SoftCat is you were constructive, you had a real commercial sense of what your customers needed. You knew what you needed from HP. And um, I think you have done a remarkable job here. The fact that you are growing as fast as, it you, as you are, the number of customers that depend on you. I mean, I, th I think you're, I mean, I'm not saying this because we're here. Um, I think you're one of the best um, partners we have in the world. And Thank you me. are just on it. And you're quick to embrace new technology. You figure out what's right for your customers and you try to bring that to them in a way that you can consume it. You know, our industry, we tend to spend a lot of time on techie blah, blah. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, it's like, could we just say what we can do to help you and how we make you money? As opposed to like this completely complex thing. And, and I think you do that better than most people. And I appreciate about the, that about I'm you. About, I'm about to cry, so you better stop. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. So, and by the way, he has, a, he has a bat phone to me as well. Yeah. And so, you know, we have a lot of discussion back and forth about where the industry is going and who's doing what to whom. So. so tell us about your experience so far at HP. What have the, the highs been and the lows yeah. been in that journey? So I think um, turnarounds, and this was a turnaround, there's no question about it. Um, are always harder than you think they're going to be. For those of you who are, have turned around your own business or are going to have to turn them around as the business changes, it's harder than you think. And, um, and so I would say the first couple of um, months and, and the first year was, was pretty challenging, actually. Like, how do you solve the problem that we had gotten ourselves into? And um, I think you have to you know, come back to what the core DNA of your company is, as we talked about earlier. And then it is all about leadership. And so the highlights have been, listen, I can see the momentum every day. I can see the company incredibly well focused. I can see that, that things are being taken on board by the local teams. If everything is coming out of corporate, we know we failed. And I say to our local teams all the time, Andy has heard me say this, do not wait for Palo Alto to rescue you. You have to be out there figuring out how you can take the assets that we have and, and make it right for the UK market. Um, so I think you know the turnaround journey, the winning hearts and minds of, of employees has been incredible. Obviously, one of the lowlights was autonomy, right? That was a very tough thing for this company. Not, not like what VW is facing, because yeah. um, it wasn't deliberate at, at, at any part of the company, but it was very tough, right? You know, and so and a big and, distraction for you, and you a pretty big distraction um, for me as well. Um, but I have to say, you know, part of being in business is, um, you know, you have to deal with what, what gets pitched to you. And, and um, you know, so we were very mature about it. We were very thoughtful about it. And we said what we knew right away. We went out there and, um, and then, you know, moved on to make that product great and, um, and to take the right down of autonomy right up front um, and tell everything we knew. And so I think we've handled it pretty well. It's been most acute, obviously, here in, uh, in the UK because autonomy was based yeah. here. But as I look back, I'm not sure how we could have handled it any better than we did. And um, as soon as we figured out what has gone on, we sized it and we went out there. I mean, I'll never forget that um, whatever day it was, Wednesday morning on CNBC, basically explaining to the world what had happened. And um, I will say that took a fair amount of courage, yeah. you know. Um, the only thing that has taken quite as much courage is debating in politics. <laughs> we'll come back to that. That's a little scary. That's even scarier. But uh, in any case, um, you know, things, things happen, right? You know, the world is not as you wish it would be. It is as it is. And um, so having sort of a practical approach to the challenges you face and saying, you know what, we'll figure out how we're going to get through this. We will figure it out. And if you show confidence, your people will follow behind. And... Um, you know, I think about this turnaround, and I think, you know, there were days where I was not sure we were going to be able to do this. And I would go home at night to my husband, and I'd say, hmm, not immediately clear that this is exactly going to work the way I thought it was. Um, but when I went in that next morning, 
we were yeah. all over it, and no one saw a crack in the armor. Uh, you know, everyone knew I believed in them, in the company, in the vision, in the strategy that we were on. And as leaders, your people look at you. They know when you believe. They know, they read your body language like children read parents. And, um, you know, so, so that leadership characteristic of, of getting through the tough times is super, super important. It, it matters what the leader yeah. does. And it's going to matter at Volkswagen what the new CEO does. And uh, you know, can he inspire the confidence that that organization will get through it? And how clear is that vision to turn it around now? And where do you think you are in that turnaround? Yeah, situation? I mean, I'd say we're now pivoting to growth. I mean, I'd say the turnaround is largely done. Listen, are we perfect? Do we make mistakes every day? Yes. You know, is it perfect in every part of the world? Yeah, no. But we are, no, it's definitely not. Um, <laughs> I can tell you a funny story. Can I tell you a funny Go story? On, please do. All right. So um, we have this phrase in HP called, when you've got a problem, escalate in 24 hours, resolve in 48. Because I wanted the company to be faster. I wanted them to run to the fire for customer problems or partner problems. I needed people to fix things and get on, get on it faster. So this is a mantra really now in the company. And you can get in as much trouble for not escalating in 24, in 48, as you could have in the old days for crossing your boss. And I think we've gotten this through the culture. So I'm in Poland the other day. Not the other day, about a year ago. And... Um, and the Pony Express had not gotten to Poland. So, because I'm talking about escalate in 24 and resolve in 48, and this employee in the Polish organization in a forum about like this raises his hand and goes, so don't you think waiting 24 days and resolving in 48 days is too long? <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh. Like, <laughs> it is just unbelievable. I'm like, I, I don't know, I don't even know what to say. <laughs> So, you know, we're not perfect, but, but I, we are now pivoting to growth. We anticipate Hewlett Packard Enterprise will grow next year. Um, in the third quarter, our enterprise group business grew 15% in local currency. Our server business grew 9%. I know you're growing even faster than that. You and I should have a competition. Okay. You're um, on. <laughs> and, in percentages, um, not well, absolute terms. Yes, but in percentages. <laughs> and, uh, and so I think we've turned the corner, and we're, we're, we're now looking forward. We're now... We're now on to the next thing and, and turning to being a growth organization. So you're probably the most driven person I've ever met in my life. What keeps that drive alive? Um, what's, what keeps you doing this rate of work and, and forcing on like you do um, yeah. when you've got, you know, you've got what you need materially? <laughs> you've done, well, that's, that's you've, you've been question, so success, right? successful previously. That's a good question. Um, I love a challenge. You know, I just love a challenge, and um, I love winning. And this was born as a little girl. I was a competitive swimmer, and there was nothing more fun than winning the, winning the swim race. And um, I bet everyone in this room, to a greater or lesser degree, loves winning, or you wouldn't be in business. You wouldn't be, you know, in the important positions that you are in at your companies. And so if you love a challenge and you love to win, um, you, you can get that joy from many places. I tend to love teams. I tend to um, love watching organizations do their thing. And I love people watching people being able to do things they couldn't do before. And um, so I think that's part of the, you know, that's part of the joy. Yeah. And um, I love the people I work with. And um, you know, I think you have to love what you do. You have to enjoy the people. Because boy, we spend a lot of time with people at work like maybe sometimes too much time. Um, but uh, you have to get joy from that environment. Okay. Um, and Sorry, just on that, that challenge. So challenge of the presidency further down the line. Would you ever go for it? It's a HP tradition now. <laughs> yeah, it's an HP <laughs> tradition. Um, no, my um, run for elected office, has. I've done that once. Yes. It was interesting. Um, we all should be glad that people want to run for public office because it's the hardest thing I've ever done. It's much harder than running HP, much harder than running eBay. And uh, so we need to be really glad that people want to run. And um, so that I will not be running for president of the United okay. States. You heard it here. Okay. And President Trump, is that a prospect that excites you? Or? <laughs> So let's really hope that the Republican Party gets through this <laughs> and wakes up. Here's the good news. Our party does tend to, um, and I'm a Republican. I ran for governor of California as a Republican. Um, but really, I vote for the best, best person. But 
our, we tend to go through this. So this time in 2012, Michelle Bachman was leading the polls, you know, a um, sort of very extreme congresswoman from the Midwest. And then we went to Herman Cain, who was the pizza magnet, and he had the 999 plan. No one can remember what the 999 plan actually was, but they know he had it. Um, then we went to Newt Gingrich, who was actually Speaker of the House, but um, a rather extreme Speaker of the House. So we tend to sort of go through these candidates. And, and my view is what happens here is, in the end, it comes down to Jeb Bush, Marco Rubio, Chris Christie, and John Kasich. And they're real people with real credentials, with real curriculum vitas, who have worked across the aisles and have done very good work. And I think, hopefully, this all kind of makes it through the, um, through the primary. You have to remember, we're four months from the first <coughs> vote. And um, you know, I think there is a, in the United States, you can feel it, there is a, there is a desire for change. Yes. You know, not politics as usual, getting people who can get stuff done. The gridlock in Washington, D.C. is frustrating much of America. Mm -hmm. So I think we're smack on time right now. Um, you need to get off, presumably, and Meg's got to go to her next 25 meetings. So uh, please give uh, Meg a round of applause.